All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Angela with Marone Bio Innovations. And I'm pleased to present to you our webinar today on biologicals and best practices to manage your palm fruit crop. We have, excuse me, we have, this course is approved for continuing education credits. Take a snapshot of this uh, slide or screenshot. We'll also be presenting you with a PDF presentation after the webinar, either later today or tomorrow. But for those of you that are with the Certified Crop Advisors, California DPR, Oregon, or Washington Department of Agriculture, we have been approved for one credit, and the course codes are here. It's important that you know all of you, whether any, any of these organizations, not just California DPR, if you are looking to receive credit, it is helpful for us because we're all doing this manually. We don't have an automated system yet. It's most helpful for us if you please take the quiz that we'll provide um, in the follow-up email after this webinar, either later today or tomorrow. You'll receive a quiz. It'll be a real simple you know, 10 to 12 question quiz. You need to make sure to put your license number or numbers into that quiz form so that we can make sure to capture um, your information, cross-reference with your attendance, and make sure you get credit, okay? I am really pleased to announce our lineup of all-star speakers. We are so um, lucky to have two university experts, academia experts online with us today. And then of course, two biological experts from Marone Bio. And I'd like to just quickly introduce uh, them to you. And then we'll get started with the content of the webinar. So my first speaker is my colleague, Steve Bogash. He began his career as the owner and operator of Greener Horizons a garden setter nursery greenhouse and landscaping operation in Mid Westminster, Maryland, before he served nearly 20 years as a horticulture educator and researcher for the Pennsylvania State Cooperative Extension and State College, Pennsylvania. Since retiring from extension service, Steve joined Marone Bioinnovations as their Northeast Mid-Atlantic Product Development and Territory Business Manager. His territory runs from Southern Virginia to Caribou, Maine, to the western edge of Ohio. He oversees several dozen university and private research company product trials, as well as many on-farm demonstration trials for Marone Bio Innovations. Steve feels that one of the most exciting things about this stage of his life and career is helping to usher in the next wave of safe, effective biological pest management products. Steve and his wife, Roberta, live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where he's honing his carpentry skills and renovating their very old home built in 1933 on the Susquehanna River. So Steve, thank you for being online today. Um, I think many of you will benefit. He's just a tremendous educator and does a great job of just really making things easy to understand. So he'll be a valuable contribution to our, our presentation today. Our next speaker is Brian Miller. He's my colleague in my, my home state of Wisconsin. He's a product development manager for the Midwest and Great Lakes. And his experience in agriculture spans 34 years with work in a variety of crops and regions from sugar beets and malting barley in Montana to citrus in Florida and fruit, vegetable and row crops in the Midwest. Prior to joining Marone Bio Innovations in 2016, he held product development roles with Union Carbide, Roan Polenic, BASF and Crop Protection Services. Ryan has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Minnesota and a Master of Science in Entomology from South Dakota State University, from South Dakota State University. So Brian, thank you for being on board. I hope it's not too cold in, in Wisconsin. My dad's birthday's today. So I was texting with him this morning and he said, you guys, are you getting more snow? I know Southeastern Wisconsin's about to get more snow. Yeah. <laughs> well, we hope um, there's more snow and precipitation coming to the West, that's for sure. Okay, our two guest speakers, um, Dr. John Wise and Dr. Carrick Cox, thank you so much for taking time out of your really busy schedules to be on our webinar. You present, uh, you're gonna provide just a really valuable amount of information. So I'd like to introduce Dr. John Wise. He's a professor at the Michigan State University Department of Entomology and Research and Extension Coordinator of the MSU Trevor Nicholas Research Center in Fenville, Michigan. His primary research is studying the performance characteristics of new insecticide chemistries 
for control of fruit insect pests. He also investigates alternative delivery systems for crop protection materials in fruit agrosystems. Dr. Wise runs the Applied Insecticide Toxicology Lab on the MSU campus, conducting research on the performance mechanisms and plant penetration attributes of pesticides, pesticide environmental fate, and anthropod resistance. So Dr. Wise is gonna be presenting a lot of details on the various ways bioinsecticides and insecticides in general work on your palm fruit crop. And then our last guest speaker, Dr. Kerrick Cox, comes from my alma mater, Cornell University in upstate New York. So Dr. Cox's research program specializes in applied plant pathology, mycology, and community stakeholder education. So he spends a portion of his time teaching as well as working in industry outreach through the um, extension system. The program's mission is to provide a better understanding of relationships between life history features of fungal plant pathogens, of fruit crops, and applied disease management practices. Understanding the impacts that management practices have on aspects of pathogen life history, such as survival, inoculum production, community structure, and propensity for resistance development will in turn allow for the sustainability and refinement of such practices to better manage disease. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Steve, who will give a brief introduction of Marone Bio and then hand it over to Dr. Cox. Steve. So this is our safe harbor statement. Marone Bio is, we're traded on the NASDAQ under MBI. Um, and so following our stocks, always fun to do, uh, but we're going to be saying some wonderful thing about, things about a number of Marone products in today's presentation. And, um, and when it comes to investing in the company, you are always recommended to do due diligence, do your own research. This is the long version of how to get there. But um, remember, trading on the stock market always has its own risks. And uh, this is telling you, uh, just because we say great things about Regalia today, don't run out and buy stock based on this. So here's today's agenda. I'm going to do a short company overview. Um, the reason that we asked Eric on here, so we're going to talk about the things you always to want, wanted to ask Eric. At least these are the things that Brian Miller and my colleague Marina Sardani always wanted to ask Eric Cox. Um, I'll do a biofungicide overview. Um, then we're going to talk about a little bit of field data and some suggested programs. And then I'm going to be handing it off to my colleague Brian Miller as we talk things about things you always wanted to ask John, or at least things that Brian always wanted to ask John. Um, and he'll also do a bio insecticide overview and field data. And then we're gonna wrap it up. Stuff you need to know, have some time for some questions. And of course, we'll come back and review the pesticide credit thing one more time before this is all over. Um, so this is about the company. This is uh, Marone Bio Innovations. We were founded in 2006. The IPO was in 2013, and there's our code on NASDAQ. Um, very recently, Kevin Helash took over as our CEO, um, and so our headquarters are out in Davis, California. We've got our manufacturing plant in Bangor, Michigan. We call it 3M. Uh, we have nationwide sales and technical support, and I'm part of that team, but we also have global distribution through a number of partners throughout the world. We've got quite a few patents. And one of the things that microorganism companies are always quite proud of is our library. Um, we've screened more than 18,000 microorganisms for their various fungicidal, herbicidal, bactericidal, and nematicidal impacts. This is our product portfolio. Um, quite a number of products now. The company was built on Regalia. This was the original product. I think we're on like version four or five of Regalia right now. Um, I've used quite a few of these versions in my research at uh, Penn State Extension. Our Mag Magistine, which is our soil nematicide and insecticide. Stargus, our recently released uh, biofungicide. Um, this is a bacillus product with unique modes of action. Pace Setter, a Regalia knockoff, which is designed for the row crop market. Then Jet Ag and Jet Oxide, our parasitic acid products as part of a recent uh, company we, we purchased them from. Um, Grandivo and Venerate are our insecticides and miticides. And then Haven, which is our anti-transpirant. What a great way to grow wonderful fruit without sunburn. So things you always wanted to ask Carrick Cox. So we're getting ready to hand it off to Carrick. So Brian and I put our heads together with our colleague Marina and others. And so we wanted to ask him, how would you include Regalia in an overall fire blight program? All right, let's see. 
Uh, and Carrick, I'm going to do all these because so, since we're going to hand all the slides yep. off to you. But if you don't answer them all, I'll come back and, and we'll we'll ask. Yeah, you, you can just read them off and yeah. read them off to me in at various yep. points. Yeah. So okay, if you want to stop your share, I'll stop. I'll start this one. So these. So, so what you're seeing here are the questions that we put together um, to ask ask Carrick. Carrick has been a, a leader in fire blight programs, and we hear about him all over the country. Yep. So we're going to be talking about why would you select certain products, um, carryover effects from regalia, uh, where do copper fungicides fit, uh, fit into the program, including low load coppers. So Carrick, this is all yours. It's a great pleasure. Um, and so I'm going to come back on at the end. Um, as, uh, as you all have questions for Carrick, put them in the chat or put them in the q and A. I am going to summarize them. And then when Carrick's all done his part of the presentation, um, I'll ask those summarized questions. Carrick, it's all yours. Thank you. Is it showing the uh, slide stuff? Yes, I see your Carrick? slides. Yeah, okay. uh, we're, we're not Great. on slide show yet, though. No, no, no. I figured now I'm going to just zoom around like, like, so, okay. Um, does any, do we, do they want to know what fire blight is? It looks like we have some people in the tropics. So maybe it's at least important to give some perspective on what this does, or we can just go jump right in and I can tell you, um, that first question, which was again, where does regalia fit into a fire blight management program? Why don't you start there, Carrick? Okay, let's do it. All right. So I guess at least the first one, since I'm going to move around a little bit wildly, I'm going to just make it really big. And well, I guess we can go in, look at some, I'll go in and zoom in. It just takes a little minute for it when it goes into stuff. So when we have a fire blight management program, um, this is what the apple phenological stages look like for those who um, don't have apples in your area of the country or, you know, are not familiar with them usually starts out with right around bud break. And we have a bunch of really interesting and funny names for the various stages. And you'll have to bear with me if I say one and you don't know what it are, is. But one of the first things we always do is we begin pruning. And as the inoculum builds, um, then we begin to use things like copper. And these aren't the low load coppers that um, Steve will ask me about a little bit later in the presentation, but um, they're the uh, real heavy ones to really get that inoculum down. And as we begin to move into the season when flowers begin to come up because that's where fire blight infects it usually infects in the flowers it emerges on cankers early on and that's why we use the copper and then once the uh um the flowers start to come out that's when they become most susceptible and that's the point of ingress and at this point this is when we want to start using isr AS, uh, sar type products or defense inducers like regalia to get the system ready so that when the fire blight lands on these flowers and causes an infection um, um, the plant is ready to respond with defenses and try to mitigate the systemic spread and eventually death of the entire orchard, which can happen in as little as a few weeks if um, the plants actually die. We're not talking about losing fruit. We're not talking about losing a couple of leaves. We're talking about complete collapse of the entire operation if these things aren't managed well. And so a lot of other things, we use some growth regulators early on to restrict growth. Um, antibiotics used a lot as well as biologicals. And this is also the window that your Stargus would show up in as well. Um, really going after that, that surface um, um, bacteria right there on that flower before it gets into the plant. And then later on, we continue with our defense inducers in purple, and then we sort of move on into late petal fall. And at a certain point, once the shoots stop growing, the fire blight stops infecting for the most part. And a lot of these things we use in various combinations in a holistic sense to really stop um, the complete, you know, collapse of the orchard, oftentimes death of the trees. And with that, so let's pop out a little bit and I'll sort of show you what our trials look like, sort of give you an idea. This is what our apple trials look like. If you grow apples, you'll realize these are an incredibly ratty um, series of gala. And that's because I've used them for fire blight research for 20 years. And we have a resistant rootstock allows me to keep using the same trees over and over again. You might think, well, doesn't that make them look awful in the beginning? No, they look like this and they look fine. They make a lot of shoots, but they're all not um, the best in best horticultural shape. But just to give you some background before I start showing you all the information on the uh, trials, we do a lot of um, timing. And as I mentioned before, fire blight starts with the infection here. And in many cases where we do a lot of the ISRs or defense inducers like regalia, we go ahead of time right before we get pre-bloom. And then when it comes to biopesticides that might actually kill the fire blight bacterium on the surface, 
um, we will really get it right when the flowers are open for our specific tests. However, if you're in a real program, or if I was following a program, um, I might make a couple other applications at 10 to 20% bloom, but this would only be targeting our um, natural inoculum in the field, which often doesn't show up. But what I do is I hit it incredibly hard with a very uh, heavy dose of inoculum. And then we measure how many of the percentage of flowers that end up getting killed by fire blight and shoot blight. In many instances for shoot blight, this is a sort of helpful to understand if you've seen other talks about using defense inducers and biologicals for shoot blight. There are two different ways of doing it. You can let natural infection take its place from the blossom infections, or you can coat scissors in fire blight and start chopping on the tree. Um, the second is a very aggressive way to really get into the, um, the tree itself and really doesn't represent what happens in the natural world. What we often think happens is that flowers get infected and lead to shoot blight infections. And so when I start showing things like SARs like regalia, I'll put them on two to five days prior. And the two to five range is for each individual product. Other products like ActiGuard may act more quickly or LifeGuard may act at a different time. And in this particular instance, I always look at the incidence of shoots on a tree. And so let's see, so let's get right in there and talk about regalia. And so I did some really early work on regalia. And this is for that blossom blight, which is the grody uh, stuff right here. And the shoot blight would look like this. So in terms of blossom blight, this is the incidence. This is the total percentage of every flower I managed to kill with um, fire blight at the time. And yes, you can see that things like antibiotics, like firewall, which is streptomycin, or a mislabeled casugamycin, which is supposed to be casugamycin, but I've accidentally typed it as strep, and things like osteotetracycline work really well. Um, it's a little harder under these sort of really intense situations for the biologicals to work. And you might ask, well, why do you use an intense situation? Why don't you use a light one? And in that case, when you use a light one, sometimes the incidence of blossoms that end up getting infected are zero to none in many instances. So we really have to put on a heavy dose to see how the products separate out. But as you can see in this particular instance against flowers, I got good control with my um, regalia program and it, it was even improved a little bit. And I don't wanna highlight too much about the future, but about using one of these low load or low metallic copper equivalent coppers. And then there's a full heavy copper program right there. Shoot blight, we see that the trends are fairly similar. Um, Regalia is working quite nicely and used at a lower dose with uh, Magnabond CS2005, which is another one of these low MCE copper products that's very soluble and easy to mix and spray um, and work quite nicely. If we move on to another year, um, the trends will continue. Uh, this is a moderate pressure year. However, I managed to kill more flowers. And well, why is that a moderate pressure? Well, fire blight likes hot, wet weather. And the hotter the weather, the weather the more intense the trial is, regardless of how much inoculum I put on the trees. But you're always trying to balance how hot it is with um, a similar level of performance. And this year, the weather wasn't as hot as 2016, but we still managed to get a good kill. But at the same time, you think, wow, nearly every flower on the tree was killed, yet I was able to do pretty good with my regalia treatment and my regalia with Magnabond. Another thing to note is that once you get so low on the low end of the spectrum, it becomes very difficult to see differences between treatments. Had I only got something like 30% here and these remain similar, um, it, you really wouldn't have seen any differences. So having that separation really helps sort of relatively give you an idea about how these things would work. Um, shoot blight, a uh, very similar level of performance. And I'm gonna skip ahead to 2019 and show a little bit. Of, oh, should I not talk about Stargus yet, Steve? Maybe not, or maybe. Sure. I mean, no. It's it's you. That's since it's I right don't here. have a specific. I don't have a specific okay. Stargus question for you. Okay. Well, anyway, it, uh, we happen to do Stargus testing and. In 2019, and um, as you can see, it works pretty well right along here. No statistical differences from stuff like firewall. We test all kinds of things like uh, grass products like alum and all of the various competitors. And it does a um, pretty good job under another nice moderate pressure year. If we go back and now sort of separated these things out a little differently and put like regalia and lifeguard and a couple others together, there's been some, um, we managed to even reduce the, um, the amount of regalia applied as we were getting in you know, new formulations and the product gets refined, it can go out in lower volumes and doses and um, still works quite nicely even by itself in this particular year. We tried putting it with a growth regulator and didn't get as much control for blossom blight, but didn't impact it for shoot blight whatsoever. So the way I see it fitting in 
is um, um, as just a nice component. And, you know, bear in mind, um, right around here, beginning early on in peak and keeping up a steady application schedule to keep those defenses high. Now, um, what this doesn't do is it doesn't put any um, anything there to actually literally kill the bacteria as it gets there. And that's where the low dose coppers come into play. And sort of give you some sort of takeaways, what I've been able to find is uh, materials like Stargus and Biological can provide almost as much as 75% control in an inoculated trial. Now remember, the environment isn't taking high amounts of bacterium and spraying them directly on the flower. So this doesn't represent a realistic um, situation for a grower. And you know they would probably be more effective in a regular natural inoculum trial or in areas where it gets cooler. The hotter it gets, the more difficult it's gonna be for the biologicals to work. And in many instances I get is equivalent or better control uh, than oxytet. Now, if you think about regalia, one of the defense inducers, similar types of um, many years, as much as 80. Um, and I really find that adding those low dose coppers in there to regalia really helps get at the any of the surface bacteria that might be present. And you know, even if you're not doing fire blight, Many of the pathogens that affect other crops are either ascomycetes, which are many of the ones that you already posted in the questions, or other bacteria. And you probably can expect a similar level of effectiveness. You bear in mind now back, a fire blight bacterium is so aggressive, it can kill a tree in a couple of weeks. So if your bacterium that you're concerned about is less aggressive than that, there's a good chance that these would work quite nicely in your systems as well. Um, this is a really nice combo. It gets the surface bacteria there, and then this works on the inside of the plant to keep the shoot blight down, which is what we want. Other things I want to, to mention, if you have a path of system that is on the inside, um, defense inducers like regalia work really well. They've gotten better every year. There's no injury in flowers. And um, if you have something that's killing on the inside of the plant, these are the best ones to go for. Uh, another thing that can happen is you can see in some of my earlier years, I wasn't as good as using the products and the formulations weren't as optimized. But I think practice and precision makes perfect. Um, you know, use them with care. You're spending money on them and they work really, really well, I think, when um, you're paying attention to your spray practices and having everything well calibrated. Let's see, what's our next question, Steve? So I think you've actually answered one and Great. two in what you were doing. So we're gonna skip down to, um, and I'm just gonna read this. Are you seeing carryover effects from regalia use in fire blight severity the following year? And Carrick, this is this relates yeah. to something you and I have discussed often. I've had this yeah. discussion with the Palmers at Reality Research. This whole thing about uh, regalia because of the ISRSAR thing, does it, yeah. is there a carryover impact? Um, that's a good question. I've, it's, I've not seen it. Now, the one thing that does carry over is um, in many cases, we often, and I didn't show this in any of our slides, we do see um, a really nice shoot growth in many instances with regalia. And, you know, I'm usually putting that in against a growth regulator, which isn't too surprising, but Sometimes I think the extra, I guess, uh, vigor of the tree makes it a little more predisposed to doing a better job next year. I don't usually when I end up going into my plots next year, and the reason I can keep doing fire blight on top of fire blight is if I leave this tri tree alone, it doesn't get any more fire blight just sitting there. So um, in many instances, nothing seems to give a lot of carry over in my trials. So I haven't really looked or been able to see any noticeable differences, but I do see that in some of our young tree trials, the trees um, look really good going into fall after regalia. And that's irrespective of how well regalia did to um, manage the fire blight in the plot. Sometimes uh, even though a tree might look really devastated by fire blight, it looks a lot better going in than other trees where I didn't use a, a defense inducer or an SAR inducer. So I think maybe it just turns the tree's um, metabolism up and uh, makes them going in better. And that's about the only thing I've noticed is that uh, um, I haven't had any issues where I wouldn't be able to use a tree after using regalia, but some of the others, if they have a catastrophic failure, um, some of the ones that don't you know, activate the tree, um, you can lose them even if they were actually pretty good at managing the amount of blossom blight early on. Sure, Just well, and one, one, of the, one of the things we know about regalia is that it does enhance chlorophyll B. 
production. I mean, you can you can yeah. see enhanced greenness. I, I'm, I'm a tomato, pepper, cucumber guy, and you can always tell crops that have had regalia applied to it, they are greener hmm. overall. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Other and, questions along those lines? Well, and Carrick, you you answered every you answered actually all your questions um, as as okay. two questions, and that's perfectly okay. You talked about low load coppers yep. as well, um, mm -hmm. and just comments because we so one of the questions that came up in the chat yep. was um, copper plus regalia phytotoxicity on pears and the possibility okay. for that. Yep. Um, and you've talked about the couple different kinds of copper, so I guess yep. we're going to get into weeds on copper for a few minutes. So let, yeah. let loose on, on your copper thing. Yeah, that's fine. And um, I think uh, in terms of copper injury, I think, and in my case is I, I, I don't ever get copper injury. Let's see if I have anything to say about it. Um, like these things here, I can put on Three quarts of badge at bloom. I can put in Magnabond at bloom, and I don't get injury on my um on either the leaves or the fruit. To be perfectly honest with you, I get more injury from captan plus adjuvants than I ever have with using copper at bloom. And I think in many instances, it's these coppers that are either optimized for um, um better mixing or low um, cellular impacts. And so this is some of our. I've been having a lot of good luck with um, Quava. And, and but particularly provisto and that's used a lot out in the uh, western united states and i think the key to avoiding copper injury is not that it doesn't happen because if i go give my talks um at our national audiences carrie pete will be like yeah i can destroy everything with copper and i think in her instances it's a lot of hot wet weather at at small young developing fruit size and young developing leaves in many instances um, we just don't get very hot weather. And by very hot, we're talking like anything above 27 C or about, you know, 60 are around bloom. And it's not raining. And the, the key with these things is solubility, well mixing. And if they're not going to sit on the tree and bake, you're not going to get a lot of copper injury at bloom, particularly with some of these heavily optimized products like Magdabon. There's a couple others I don't have on this slide but provisto and i mean i didn't know what provisto was i was given that one in particular as a uh, numbered compound later i was told what it was i just thought it was a had no idea it was a copper i just don't get a lot of injury and i think the further up north you go the better off you will be in terms of being able to use and you know a lot of these are rates that are optimized for bloom anyway and a lot of you are able to do this if you are in a tropical area and it's hot and wet all the time no you probably don't want to do it um, as much, or you want to be very careful and test a couple of the different copper products. One of the best ways to do it is just to, um, in many instances, we used to conduct trials, specifically trying to create situations of injury. And that's where you usually can get a lot of injury with captan, but I have not had too much injury with, uh, with the copper products. And this, I don't know if that helps, but I think that's the key mixing solubility. And, you know, a lot of these things don't go in at these as um, well, except that one 2x does a lot of these aren't powders, the liquids are going to be better for that. I think they're going to do their deed and they're going to wash off the fruit and move on to the next area or they're not going to be at such a high level or get inside the tissues. Okay, so I've got a couple more questions and I'm trying to keep up with your sure. Q&A. So this one, Carrick, is from Tim Johnson. Um, and he's asking about, uh, no, any, you know of any, yeah, do you know of any varietal differences um, in sensitivity to copper? Uh, to copper? I don't know. I know like certain crops like pears and things can be easily, more easily hurt. Gala is supposedly one that can be hit. We have a large block of a lot of um, of the newer apple varieties that we're testing is usually part of Susan Brown's breeding program. And I've managed to get some other um, some other of the uh, fancy apples from around the country when allowed. We can't get them all, but I haven't seen anything yet. I mean, you know, it's not like we'll, we'll go out and I'll spray Evercrest and it'll rust it up. It's it's fine under the same practices. And let's see what else have we done. Snapdragon, Ruby Frost, some of those others. I've tried to get Cosmic Crisp, can't. Tried to get Mini Miniesca this year for some of that work. Nope, not not. they're not going to give it to me. But um, in many instances, I haven't found a variety too heavily um, impacted yet. I think it's really a hot, wet environmental um, phenomenon. And just being mindful of your growth stage. If you're in that, you know, really young developing fruit stage, whether or not it's stone fruit like shock split or 10 to 15 millimeter for apple or 
um, those cells are really, really susceptible to any damage and being careful. And I, I will actually, now that, I, now that you mention it, I will say this, the adjuvants I find often are the ones that help me see the, uh, the injury the most. They can be great. They can make the products last longer, but I had a trial with one person's biological and they asked me to use one adjuvant and it burned the flowers off all the trees. And the one time they asked me to exclude it, everything was well. So I think that's another factor that can be involved. If particularly you're in a warmer, wetter environment, the additional adjuvant to make it stay on the piece of fruit or leaf longer may end up causing you more trouble. And, you know, Gala gets marked up. We get scarf skin on it. Snapdragon gets marked up. We get scarf skin on that. But um, I don't seem, we don't seem to be able to cause any trouble with um, chemical burn. And um, in many instances, a lot of times I get asked to include adjuvants, but not always. I think, I think recently in, um regalia yeah we've had regulate i like um that's not been a bad one um that's been pretty good um not as much of a fan of the li 700s but um sure. and well know your adjuvants i mean that's just a yeah know your adjuvants and know what works best on your varieties for your adjuvants in many instances all you need to do in order to make cap 10 destroy or defoliate any plant is get it inside the leaves it's actually very cytotoxic or copper in that case. That's why they don't want you dumping it on the ground um, <laughs> for the most part. Yep. Hey, other I'm, questions? I'm, I'm, I'm working on summarize. So another question here is relating to regalia and bitter pit on Honeycrisp. Obviously, bitter bitter, bitter pit is the bane of Honeycrisp. Um, yeah, because of the, sure is. Yeah, do you, do you grow much Honeycrisp? And have you ever noticed no, that? Wait, no, that's, no, that's one variety we're going to start getting as part of our big scree grant. And now we have a lot. And I've usually relied on my friend Dan Donahue to talk all about, um, I wish he was here right now. Peter's probably running down the hall. No, um, to get him. But he, I don't think we've ever had any issues of it making it worse. If anything, I think it, I, I can't imagine how it would affect calcium shunting in the apple. But that is a very interesting concept i don't have any bitter pit i mean we get lentil breakdown in some of the fancy varieties but nothing to make me think that um, um regalia would have made it worse if anything i just feel like the uh the vigorous greenness might <laughs> maybe contribute but we don't really know that's a really a good fruit yeah. physiologist question and so yes yep i haven't done that yet and we do see it in snapdragon but never on um you know a regalia type thing Okay, so Carrick, I think so we're wrapping up, I think, your formal right. remarks right now. So I'm going to keep watching the Q&A and chat. You're going to stay on till the end of this, I hope, right? Yeah, I'm going to stay on to the end. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can okay, do the so next I'm, thing. I may, have, I may have some more questions for you. And That's so fine. for everybody who's listening, if you have more questions for Carrick, keep putting them in the Q&A or chat and I'll keep watching for them. And Carrick, I have one last question for you. And this is only because sure. I have visited you in your office. What is on your phonograph today? What are what were you listening to before? Oh, actually nothing. I had to. I'm not. All, I'm not really allowed to be in the office unless I'm doing something serious, okay, like this so. cool webinar. So what? Nothing is on the phonograph today, unfortunately. It has not okay. been plugged in in a long time. So for everybody, Carrick keeps a, quite a collection of LPs. It's always oh, yeah. interesting to see what he's playing in his office. Oh, yeah. All right, Carrick, you're going to go Thank silent you. now, and we're going to get yep, back I'll into go. the rest of the presentation. All right, Angela. So regalia. Um, so regalia, um, and this will answer some of the other questions that I saw coming up in the Q&A and chat. So regalia is a liquid biofungicide. It is an as a extract of Renatria saccolinensis, a giant knotweed. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. It's uh, I'm trying to get it into screen share. <laughs> okay. Or, we'll come back to it. Are you good? I'm good. Uh, we're still. We're only seeing the. the we're not. We're not there. We go. No. Nope. Not quite I in slide. I can't get to the there. Oh, for Pete's sake. Bear with me, team. We'll just, we, we can wait a minute. Patience is a good thing. There we go. Is that good? There we go. That looks much better. Um, so it's, as I mentioned, it's giant knotweed extract. It's very broad spectrum. Um, the, the primary modes of action are as ISR, SAR promoters. These are um, very complex biochemical pathways that plants have. And so regalia turns these on. I, I liken it, there are many ways to turn these pathways on and they are very complex. 
regalia is like pushing down on all the keys of a piano at once. It really turns on these pathways to a very high level. Um, it's compatible with an awful lot of other materials. I have tank mixed regalia with so many things over the years. Copper most commonly, but Manco Zeb as well. You can apply it foliarly, airily. There are chemgation requirements. You can use it as a soil drench. Um, and so this is this is one of those products that um, one one tree fruit grower told me he says I just make sure I have some in every tank. I, I think that's a great practice. Of course, I sell the stuff as well. So here's how it works. Uh, we have this ISR mode of action, uh, which triggers a number of antimicrobial compounds inside the plant: phenolics, phytoalexin, patho pathogenesis resistant proteins. Um, it strengthens the cell walls. We actually get more lignin depo deposited in epidermal cell walls. Obviously, this makes it a lot more difficult for pathogens to penetrate. And then we get this promotion of plant growth. Um, we stimulate phytohormones. And I've mentioned the chlorophyll B when we were talking with Carrick, we actually see an increase in chlorophyll B. Um, in a lot of vegetables, we can actually measure an increase in yields directly from regalia applications. Stargus is our newer product. It's another liquid, liquid biofungicide, typically applied at one to four quarts per acre. Um, it is best applied preventatively like regalia. Um, and so you wanna be proactive on all these things. This is a unique isis, isolate of Bacillus Nakamurai F727. You know, there's a lot of Bacillus products out there, but one of the different things about regalia is all the novel modes of action that it brings to bear. Very effective on a lot of diseases that most Bacillus are not. Um, and the way it works is during fermentation, these peptides are created, and that's what you're actually applying. Although Stargus is alive, and so there is the opportunity to make more of these compounds. When you buy a jug of, of Stargus, what are you applying are the peptides that were created uh, during fermentation, and you also see this ISR activity. Here's more on the modes of action. Um, so the active ones are these peptides that are produced during fermentation. They actually attack uh, uh, spore germination, and it's like a contact, it's a contact kill. It prevents them from getting in. Um, the living spores uh, develop and colonize on parts of the plant, and this can form a shield preventing pathogen access to the plant. And then there's the ISR track. And the ISR and SAR modes of action are worth reading about. They're just so important in how we manage things biologically. If you contact me, I've got some great articles to share with you on them. So JETAG is a peroxyacetic acid material. It acts, acts as a fungicide, perox, uh, a fungicide, bactericide, and algicide um, for both foliar and soil-borne diseases. And how does it work? By oxidation. These are peroxyacetic acid materials. Um, and so compatible with many things, we do not like to, uh, to mix PAA with coppers. Um, they, they do bad things in the tank. Um, so this is not mixable with everything, but you'll find that um, like Regalia and JetAg are really good tank mix partners. Um, because of the way it works, it's a physical, um, it's a physical material, it works by oxidating. We don't see any resistance and there's no, res no residue whatsoever. If you're applying this with copper, apply JETAG first, it'll break down quickly, and then you apply the copper. And now I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Brian. Okay, I hope, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we have seen Brian? Uh, in some of the work that I've done. Can you speak louder? It's really hard to hear you. Can everybody else hear Brian okay? Okay. Okay, Brian, it's really hard to hear you. Okay. Not sure how we're going to speak to that. That's, it sounds like it's getting better. Okay. Good. All right. So I just needed to turn It's still, down. hang on, Brian. Okay. Is there any way to get closer to your microphone? I was thinking my microphone was right in front of me. Uh, it might be uh, that it's on my computer, which is in the docking station. How about that? Is that any better? A little bit. Just project really loud. Okay, I can talk loudly. Um, <laughs> just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the disease uh, control pro or, uh, uh, studies that I've uh, conducted uh, in Michigan primarily, and uh, looking at uh, the suppression of fire blight at Michigan State that we've done. Uh, this uh, particular study was uh, focused on uh, uh, shoot blight 
and uh, on some old Jonathans, which are certainly very susceptible to fire blight. Uh, two applications were made with, with uh, regalia. Uh, May 16th, which was early uh, mid bloom, 70 to 80% uh, bloom, and then also at full bloom. Uh, this was an inoculated study. Um, and then the uh, blossoms were evaluated and then also shoot light. So I wanted to focus on the shoot light. Uh, particularly, uh, you'll notice that uh, regalia did very similar uh, levels of control to what you see with streptomycin. Uh, Michigan is, is a place where we do have a lot of resistance to, um, to uh, the well, streptomycin particularly. So this is an important tool in helping manage that resistance. Uh, Angela, can you go on to the next? So, oh, there, I have control, good. Um, so just a, a picture being worth uh, a, a lot more description. So what we see on the uh, right-hand side, um, this is the result of all those bloom infections that occurred in the untreated control and how it spread. It's run to the terminal, it spread to additional terminal, terminals next to it, uh, again, in hot, humid weather, this can really blow up and get out of control uh, as it has in the untreated uh, trees. As you see on the left-hand side, you'll see some uh, examples of where we saw a little bit of a uh, spread uh, from the bloom, but really it didn't jump uh, from one terminal to the next. It also didn't run very far within that terminal. So uh, where we really hang our hat with regalia in the fire blight piece is helping out with shoot light. So we want to just to mention that that's where uh, I think where we, we seem to shine. Um, looking at, I guess, Angela, you're going to uh, move it forward for me. There we go. Uh, so other ISR products um, along with Apogee. Now, sadly, this does not work for our pear growers who might be joining us. Uh, Apogee is not registered on pears. Um, However, in the situation where we're trying to grow uh, young trees, particularly, we want them to fill their space as quickly as possible to reach that high wire on the trellis. So um, the use of Apogee as a growth regulator to shorten the terminals, but the, to shorten them uh, temporarily, it's, it's just a, 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 a very uh, short term effect. So by using the two ounces. Uh, where normally on a high density orchard, eight to uh, 12 ounces would be normal. Um, we can go with a lower rate, get a, a moderate amount of suppression for a short period of time, combine it with the Apogee, and we do a very good job of controlling um, the, uh, the uh, shoot strikes. And again, I'm comparing myself in this particular study, you'll look at the two uh, ones in the center, we have Regalia, plus Apogee, and then Actigard, another product that does not organically register, also uh, being used and, and to, to positive effect. Um, would, you move, would you move to the next one? Okay, it looks like I'm still having trouble with um, hearing. Um, let me see if I can pull this. Oh, I don't wanna do that. Okay, get my so Brian, we just lost your screen or your video. Are you still there? Back. Okay. Now you're on mute, Brian. Okay, I got it mute. Can you, I'm, I, I heard a little message that they still couldn't hear me very well. That's gotten better. Okay, can you see my screen? I, we can see the screen, we just can't see your, your video, your face, but no. we can no. see the screen, you know, the slide. Just as well as far as that goes. Okay, <laughs> there you are. So apologies for the, uh, yeah, we're just gonna leave that off because I, for some reason, <laughs> My camera has a, uh, a microphone and it is not picking up. Okay. Let's go to the, uh, the, the next slide. We're looking at uh, a rehash of that data that I, I saw that I, I showed you. And I just thought I'd uh, want to highlight that Regalia plus Apogee spray done three times, comparing that to Actigard and Apogee sprayed three times. 
And then here's the price point uh, that's, I think, worth understanding that we're looking at roughly $70 for the Apogee uh, our regalia program. And in the uh, case of ActiGuard, we're looking at uh, an, an additional expense. So uh, similar results um, and uh, better price point. Um, again, looking at an organic program for pears, um, several things. We're looking at regalia uh, treated at three different timings. And uh, then also in between, we're looking at a combination of Stargus plus Jet A. And that's our program. Uh, again, did a very, we wanted to see, could we compare favorably to uh, conventional programs using, uh, in this particular case, uh, the uh, uh, Ag Strep and uh, Mica Shield plus Copper um, versus uh, um, Regalia Act, uh, Actigard with Jet Ag and Stargus. Um, again, those aren't organic programs. The one on the far right would be an organic program. In addition, we saw little to no russeting in that program, which is something that was problematic in the other treatments. Um, go ahead. Uh, again, for organic growers, uh, Blossom Protect being one of the uh, uh, standards uh, doesn't work well for a conventional program, especially in the eastern part of the country because uh, we're also trying to control scab at the same time, which is going to damage our Blossom Protect yeast. Uh, so uh, in this particular case, Regalia uh, used with Blossom Protect uh, and uh, we also included Jet Ag into the program, but performed very, very well. And again, no vital. So uh, recommendations again for pears and maybe a little bit similar to uh, palm fruit as well. We like regalia in early, uh, start to prime the plants and get that uh, plant health uh, moving, uh, more or less systemic activity. Uh, looking at uh, on palm fruit, we've looked at Stargus in the bloom and the full bloom. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Lois and uh, uh, Morena have had research in the Pacific Northwest, uh, combining it with Jet A to positive effect. Um, regalia it would come later at Pebble Fall or possibly a little bit later. Uh, again, we're focusing on shoot blight and protecting that. Next. Okay. Things that we wanted to ask John. So John, uh, get yourself primed and ready to uh, get your microphone unmuted. Um, so biopesticides are a growing part of the pesticide control program. Just some impressions that you have on um, bioinsecticides. That's one thing we would like you to cover. Um, what insects are critical to control and where can bioinsecticides help out? Uh, next also adding uh, bioinsecticides for help with resistance management. And then lastly, um, the REI is uh, four hours for these products. The PHI is zero. Um, uh, there are no MRLs to be concerned about. So how is that helpful? So those are my questions, John. I'm gonna let, hand it off to you. All right, John, and you're still on mute, just so you know. Okay, I hope you can hear me. You're great. Better than Brian there. It's difficult to hear his voice. And then I'm gonna to go to slideshow, if it will allow me. I've clicked it. Ah, there we go. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian for the introduction and a couple of questions and you will remind me of those questions if I don't cover them, but I think I will touch on uh, most of them broadly and then we'll, we'll have time for questions. Uh, thank you everybody for making time this afternoon. And I've put some thought into what I can share here in 20, 25 minutes that would be useful and informative. And uh, I start with this slide showing that on, on one side we have products that I consider as conventional insecticides. As you, as you can see, these are the classes of materials. Some of them have been around 50 years. Those are the top of that list. 
then others are, are newer, but they are synthetic or, or conventional in, in nature. But then on the right is this growing list of biopesticides. Now, if we went back 25 years and you asked me my thoughts about bioinsecticides, I wouldn't have a lot of positive things to say because most of the, most not all, but most of the biopesticides that I had a chance to work with in the early 1990s, uh, the performance did not stand up. It's nearly as close to conventional materials as I thought uh, would be valuable to growers. However, I think this has changed dramatically in the last 10 plus years, especially the last 10 years. And, and there's a number of new biopesticides that I want to make sure people are aware of. Of course, BTs are not new. They're one of the older uh, biopesticides that, that do have reliable, maybe more selective, but reliable performance. Uh, but then uh, Marone's products like Grandivo and Venerate are, are pretty exciting. Uh, we'll look at some data where they have been put head to head with conventional materials on some pretty tough pests, whether it's uh, spotted wing drosophila or codling moth, et cetera. And when they can, they can stand up in those, uh, those target pests, they're worth talking about. There are, there are others. Uh, there's an older product, uh, Ver well, it's, now it's called Veritran, which is a Sabadilla uh, biological, and it's not yet registered in most of the fruit crops, but it's being worked through IR4 and the registrant, and it, it's on its way, and I think has a lot of promise. Uh, another one is what I call the, the spider venom. It's really peptides, uh, but we, we think about the, the origin in uh, poisonous spider venom that is now called spear T and spear lep, and that, that I think is pretty exciting. And then there's some others like the uh, codling moth uh, virus, particle film technology like surround, uh, potassium silicate, and, and others. So that's the backdrop that we really have a toolbox that is much fuller and much broader than uh, 30 plus years ago. And, and, and growers should know that these are tools uh, available for protecting the crops. I do wanna point out that when we're talking about newer or modern synthetic insecticides, as well as many of the, the biopesticides that we have to broaden our understanding of how the job gets done. We should be concerned about crop protection and not necessarily on a specific mode of activity upon which uh, the protection is given. Sure, we many of the older products are primarily uh, lethal uh, agents, toxicants, but there's a whole array of activities that, that some of the newer materials use in concert to protect the crop, things like overposition deterrence, antifeedants, repellency, curative action, which is the term I use for when the plant penetrative attributes are able to move the product into the plant substrate and, and kill the pest uh, after it has entered the plant, whether that's fruit or foliage. And then sublethal effects, which is essentially when an, an adult stage is exposed to the compound and there isn't direct lethal effects, but the eggs that are laid by that adult are non-viable and therefore not a threat uh, to the crop uh, in terms of egg laying in, in fruit. So these are all things that are worth being aware of when we when we think about newer materials, whether they're biopesticides or synthetic materials. This is one of, of many tables that I've developed over the years that 
help summarize these different factors that um, contribute to uh, performance, mode of action, mode of entry, insecticidal activity, speed of activity. We're not going to go through this table one by one, but it's but if you look at it, you can see that from the older materials on the top of the table to the newer biologicals near the bottom, there's an array of, of attributes that uh, contribute to plant protection. And it's, it's worth your time knowing what they are if you're going to use the product so that you're using the product correctly, optimally, and you get the most bang for your buck. So next I'm going to go through couple different pests that I was asked to prepare for and summarize. And I'm not going to show extensive amounts of data, but enough data to kind of make the point, but, but really have the approach of saying, what's our toolbox for this pest? What's our toolbox for a different pest? And give you a sense for what options there are uh, depending on what we're targeting. And, and all, the, all the trials that we've done that, that inform the, these uh, recommendations are really based on work that either I've done or my colleagues have done on research stations and, and um, uh, small plot trials and in the data you, you will see here coming forth. So the first one was to ask the question, what, what kinds of tools do we have in our toolboxes for aphid control? And the, as you know, there's, there's more than, than one aphid that's relevant in home fruit production. There's rosy aphids, green aphids, woolly apple aphid, but broadly the, the, the classes and trade products that you see in red are the ones that, that I view are tools in your toolbox that are worth considering. So on the left, we can see we've got neonicotinoids. Uh, we have some insect growth regulators. Uh, some of the newer classes of insecticides uh, like Closer, Savanto, and then diamides like Exeril and Harvanta, Movento, and then the pyrazoles and pyr pyridines and pyropenes, APTA, PQZ. So there, there's a, a good number of synthetic products that are labeled and perform well on, on aphids. And then biopesticides also, uh, Grandevil and Venerate are effective on, on aphids and we'll see a little bit of data, but as well as uh, azadiractin from the neem tree uh, and uh, spear T as well as sil, sil matrix. Just a couple data slides. I, I've got two or three years, maybe more than three years of data on Grandevo and, and Venerate. This just happens to be a, a little bit older one where we had very, very high level of pressure in, of, from rosy apple aphid. We had Closer performed excellent. Savanto was excellent and found that uh, Grandevo also uh, performed quite well and at that time, we we're still working out some adjuvant issues and some timing issues. As you can see, the Grand Evil that was applied at pink, in this case, performed better than the Grand Evil that was applied at petal fall, in part because we know rosy apple aphids will curl the leaves and, and are protected from foliar sprays uh, the later the season goes along. Here are two different trials, uh, two different years of just representing performance of products on woolly apple aphid. Uh, the top one, you can see Movento, Savanto, and Closer. All three of those looked quite, quite good. And then in uh, 2017, the lower slide, we compared Savanto with Venerate, and they both did quite well. They, that was a 2017, actually a higher level of, of pressure that built throughout the season from woolly apple aphid and they each had a, a single application and, and, and did quite well um, throughout the season. Uh, 
Uh, next week, we're the only the only set of slides that I have focused on something besides apples is this Paracilla uh, summary. And similar to the to the aphid trial, we we have a fair number of conventional products that are active on, on Paracilla. You can see them all in in red. It doesn't mean that they're all equal or all a single application kind of material. For example, neonicotinoids uh, will tend to be more of a mid to late season cleanup kind of material for Paracilla, whereas uh, season long products like Agrimec, or at least historically Agrimec was a season long single early application. And so there is variability amongst this list of products, but they're all labeled and all considered uh, tools in your toolbox. And then on the on the biopesticide side, uh, we have Grandivo, Azadiractin, and and Spear T as materials where there are we have some data that look um, I think quite good. I'm just going to show uh, one slide here that is showing a a season long uh, population growth of Paracilla in the black line. You can see from early June to mid July, the population ramps way up. And then the green line is um, Agrimec application that was made early in, in early June and then uh, another spray in mid July. So you could see that that population grew and then we sprayed Agrimec again and it dropped it for uh, a number of weeks before it rebounded. I'll, I'll, I'll be, uh, I want to be clear that I've also had many cases where Agrimec performed better than what this particular data set shows, but the, but the data are the data. In comparison, I want to point out that we had very good success that, that year in using uh, Venerate as a foliar two applications, one early and then one in the middle of July. That's the uh, blue line that you can you can see. And basically the venerate stayed below the economic threshold, maybe right on the right on the cusp there at the end of July, but 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 stayed relatively flat compared to the Agrimec. Um, and then Azosol is just a formulation of Azadiractin or neem. And the, the the yellow line was two applications, just like the other two. Uh, and just for fun, because I like to play around with uh, different delivery systems, a single trunk injection of the same rate of Azosol gave season-long control. That's the red line. And it, it really points out that if you are using a biopesticide that is sensitive to UV degradation, a foliar application may require more active ingredient throughout the season than if you can deliver in a way like trunk injection that is uh, protects it from degradation. The caveat is that in, in tree fruits, there aren't very many uh, products that are labeled with trunk injection as a delivery system, but it's it's a research question that I've been asking. Uh, Azosol actually is legal to be used either foliar or trunk injection, but I think uh, given the level of paracilla pressure, it's it's a it's a nice data set to share with you. Next, uh, oblique band leaf roller and, and other leaf rollers. There's a fairly good uh, toolbox of, of tools. Not quite as many as you can see, not as many in red as the previous couple of pests, but yes, we have insect growth regulators like Ryman, Avermectins like Proclaim, uh, all the diamides, and all the spinosins like Delicate and Trust are all uh, excellent on oblique banded leaf roller. And then on the biopesticide side, I think it's, it's I can pretty confidently say that BTs are, are effective they have some weaknesses in terms of uh, being used in cold, cooler weather versus hot weather. They need to be ingested, right? So the, the, the warmer weather, there's more ingestion by leaf rollers. And then Grandivo and Venerate, we've had a number of uh, good 
trials demonstrating leaf roller uh, control and, and they're, they're good tools. And I, I just have one, one slide just, just demonstrating that there's lots of different products that, that control uh, bleak banded leaf roller and the toolbox is fairly full. And here's one that had uh, Venerate and Grand Devo compared to Gladiator, which is a premix of uh, synthetic pyrethroid and avermectin. And, and it performed quite well uh, compared to the entry check, uh, but so did the, the two biologicals in, in that trial. Codling moth, as we progress, we're, we're looking at pests that are much more high profile, much higher impact pests in terms of production and profitability. And, and we can see in red on, on the left, we can see we have a number of neonicotinoids, insect growth regulator, regulators like Ryman, uh, Proclaim, the diamides in spinosins. I think in, I, it would be fair to say that in, in Michigan, apple growers rely pretty heavily on the diamides and the spinosins, meaning delegate. And I think it's it's worthwhile from a resistance management standpoint to say, be aware of the other tools in your toolbox because we don't want to lose uh, those two important classes. And codling moth has a propensity for developing resistance. Uh, you burn things out, and it you've got another you've got to find another way uh, to protect your crops. Uh, I do want to point out that that there's a couple of materials that I recommend for first generation that don't stand up to the degree that others might for second generation. One of them is Proclaim, that's the Avermectin material, and then Bile, a neonicotinoid. I feel confident about first generation use, not so much about second generation. I can talk more why that is if people want to hear, but that's that's my experience. On the biopesticide side, Grandivo has has looked uh, good uh, for codling moth. The spider venom peptide called Spearlep has has looked good, and Spearlep has the the peptides plus. A little bit of BT in it that helps to uh, penetrate through the stomach of the pest in order to deliver that toxicant uh, into the hemolymph of, of the codling moth larvae. And of course, codling moth granulosis virus been around for some time. It's it's a tool that is is consistent. It has some strengths and weaknesses in terms of a little shorter residual and 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 fairly selective in uh, not being a contact poison like some traditional materials. But, but anyway, I, I just want to encourage people to rotate and try new things, uh, if no other reason, just for resistance management um, approach. And a couple, couple data sets. This is a, a recent trial where we had spear lep at two different rates of one pint and a two pint rate. Uh, we had delegate Alticor and then Proclaim. And I think it's, it's useful to see that this particular trial demonstrates the point I was making about some products being more relevant for first generation. You can see Proclaim looked quite good on the red bar, first generation codling moth, not as good second generation. And Spearlep was, was similar. Alticor, there was no difference in performance first or second generation. And I think that largely falls in with what we know about these, these tools and how to use them. And then we ha I had a trial, uh, a season long trial where I teased out Venerate and Grand Evil. Codling moth data in the red bar it's a, it's a little flip-flopped on this slide. The red bar is the first generation codling moth and Venerate looked quite good. Grieval, uh, Grandivo looked good, um, not, not as good in the green bars, second generation codling moth. And then we had a 
the comparison conventional standard was kind of a mix rhyme and delegate and then alta core sale and second generation but they look uh, of course uh, more uh, uniform across I have a little bit of Apple Maggot data in here that I don't have later because it was just taken out of this season long trial. And you can see that here that that venerate look better uh, than Grand Devo uh, for Apple Maggot. And I understand that it now has a two double E uh, labeled targeting Apple Maggot in, in palm fruit. Uh, the last target pest that I have to, to lay out this uh, analysis is apple maggot. And, and we can see on the left that we have a number of conventional insecticides, organophosphates probably, organophosphates probably the, the, the most reliable uh, apple maggot product, uh, whereas codling moth and leaf roller and a number of other pests have built resistance to organophosphates, apple maggot, continues to be sensitive and products like imidan are, are, are important tools, but, but the neonicotinoids as well, in particular, I would say a sale, be, not that it's as much of a contact poison to adults like imidan, but it has that curative action that will prevent successful larval development in the fruit. Then of course, uh, the later generation diamides, not as much the early generation diamides, but the later ones like Exeril Veritaprin, Apta actually has looked good on Apple Maggot, and then Delegate, I would say good, but maybe not excellent. And then on the right, the biopesticides, you see Venerate from the data you saw in, in the new label. And then, and then particle film or surround WP has always been good. It just has the complication of how do you get the white stuff off the off the fruit uh, before the product is sold? But uh, but it is a tool. And here you you can see some some data where we've got imidan really looked great for apple maggot and a sale also looked great. Even the uh, splat which has spinosin inside the, the 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 bait material looked quite good and then synthetic pyrethroids, I always have felt that they're quite moderate in their effectiveness on, on apple maggot. And these, these data support that. Um, kind of wrap things up. That My main point was to kind of give a little bit bigger picture, little bit of data, bigger picture. And I think the lens that I would encourage people to, to consider these tools is, is just to think about where the strengths are and the weaknesses are. Think about the pests you're targeting. Uh, always be thinking about resistance management. Don't wait for products to fail to rotate to other modes of action. Be proactive. And, and I, I encourage people to try to gain some confidence in newer tools, whether they're synthetic or biopesticides, develop confidence by using them on limited basis so that then if you do if you if you need to move and depend on them you're not uh, lacking the confidence in the familiarity go ahead and, and and begin integrating tools and learning what their benefits are and then of course the last point is that the a particular strength of biopesticides is that if there are either the crop or the situation, the market situation that you are concerned about MRLs and residues at harvest, uh, they're mostly e exempt from those national and international barriers to, to trade and have that um, brand equity or that value to you in that, that degree. So I am, open to questions. I should probably stop share and we can open this up again if someone needs to. Otherwise, we can just answer questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wise. Um, are there any questions 
So I need, I'm, I'm gonna rely on my colleagues right now to look at the Q&A because it's difficult for me while I have this screen open. Is everybody seeing the, the presentation? I'm just gonna quickly scroll through I it. I see the presentation and I've been, I've been following the Q&A. Brian, how, how's, how's your, can we hear you at this point, Brian? Is this a little bit better? A little bit. Yeah, Come you're closer. Still, yeah, you're kind of in a cave. Really Maybe high. Steve, you can lead us. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to get this going. So um, I've seen a couple questions about Plum Cure Culio and um, both Grandivo and Venerate. So John, if you want to jump in, I know we've, we've done a lot of research on that. So I'm guessing you have some opinions on it. Yes. So the question was about Plum Cure Culio control with Grandivo and Venerate. And we do have a number of years of data. I think Marone probably has data well beyond uh, Michigan State University. And the way I would summarize it is this, that I, I am confident that they are active on Plum Curculio and can be uh, tools that are, that are useful. The, the challenge that I have is, is that with this pest, in the small plot trials that I conduct. These small plot trials where you have a sea of untreated trees around them, in, this, in some cases the pest pressure is absolutely tremendous, is that it, it, those trials tend to skew in favor, the results tend to skew in favor of contact nerve poisons and products that rely on um, other modes of action. Like I, I've seen some, some data that show that Grandivo has some of this lethal activity that, that uh, we see sometimes in IGRs. And sometimes what you have to do to really demonstrate performance for softer materials is have a larger scale. You need to have something that's more similar to a grower uh, sp spraying across an entire acre or two, uh, 10 acres or or more to see the benefit or the, the population effect of the products. So yes, I have, I have some data that really look promising. And I've also had a couple, couple cases where it was, it was pretty tough, not only for the Grand Evo and Van Rape, but maybe some other uh, newer products. So it's, it's a difficult pest. Um, and that's, I would be glad to have Steve or Brian add a, a broader perspective from a, a larger data set. So Brian, um, I'm going to, even though you're in a cave, I'm going to ask you a question because um, you and I have had this discussion often. So if a, if a grow, an organic grower trying to manage plum pure culio using venery and surround, um, what would be your recommendations for making that work as well as it can? Sure. Um, surround uh, carries the ball a certain distance. Um, we have, and I think John's data was kind of uh, looking at that one. Um, it appeared as though actually we got a little bit better uh, control with Grandivo than we did with Vannery. Um, it added another uh, 10 to 20% on top of what you would see with just the surround. So for an organic production, uh, the two together are what I would suggest. And uh, the timings would be in a uh, petal fall and maybe the first cover or possibly the second cover after uh, and with surround. And then after that, um, we wouldn't require, uh, continue to recommend surround. John, any thoughts? I, I, I agree with your comments. And I think that's still a work in progress, uh, but there's enough promise that that uh, maybe even some growers can can try some of these things and have larger scale trials and see if we can uh, really confirm what I think looks promising at, at least. So there's a couple things going on, right? So I hope you all are paying attention to the Q&A. Um, Pam Marone is in there I'm having a, there's a discussion going on on the side. It's worthwhile following. Um, and then I've seen a couple questions from Doyle on um, Apple, Apple Maggot, I believe. Oh, wait, um, Apple Aphid, I'm sorry, Woolly Apple Aphid. Um, and so, um, John, you want to get into Woolly Apple Aphid management? So it looks like um, 
we want to stick with organic. So if you wanted to manage woolly apple aphids organically, um, and you know, it's a Maroon presentation, but if there are other products that would help, we, we're, we're in it for control total. Yes, so one of the challenges of woolly apple aphid is they're not as predictable as some other pests. And in, if you begin to see them in June, it's likely that they're going to uh, progress and the population is going to increase by the time we get to September, October, which then they move from the aerial phase to the root phase. And that's where the real damage is done to longevity of trees. A, a disadvantage of the biologicals is, well, I mean, actually there are some biologicals that have plant mobility, but, but there are, uh, there's one or more synthetic products that, that have the ability to move in flow them from the foliage back down into the roots and get at that, that root phase. I'm not aware that the biologicals, any of the biologicals can do that, but what, what the data that I've produced and read from others is that at a minimum, the biologicals can, can kill the aerial phase uh, like, like Grand Evo and Venerate uh, in the summer months. And it may also be in the time of year in, in June where you're also controlling other things, leaf, leaf rollers and um, green aphids and some other things. So at least you're kind of spreading the cost of that product over a number of targets. I, I will not claim to be an expert on woolly apple aphid and, and sometimes you, you wanna do some work and it doesn't show up, uh, but that's, that's what I can say at the moment unless there's a more specific question. I think, I think that probably took care of our question. And um, with the exception of the um, intense chats going on in the q and I think we've actually cleaned up our, our questions at the moment, at least largely. Um, I, I saw there was a question about hazelnuts. This is obviously not a hazelnut thing. So the hazelnut question, um, one of my colleagues is going to tell you how to get hold of each, of each of us in your region in just a moment. So I would forward your hazelnut question to that person. And there was a question about tropical um, fruits and vegetables. And um, my recommendation would be the same thing. Contact your local person, and then they will follow up and get you the information that you need. Hey, Steve, I'm going to jump in a minute because I see a, a few of the chats about the question of what's a biopesticide and what's not. And there's... Jump in, John. Have fun. Comment, on yeah, have fun. And, 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 you know, I'm not a registrant. I'm not a regulatory expert. But, I, but I, what I think, what I actually think is the most interesting is that these two groups are becoming more difficult to separate. The, in, in, in fact, when I was working on this presentation at one moment, I had the spinosins over on the biopesticide side and then I switched it back over on the conventional side. And um, an argument can be made about what in what aspects spinosin should be thought of as a biopesticide versus a conventional I'm not going to try to argue with anybody, but I think what's more important than the category is what's the value of the tool, and if if it, if you're an organic grower, then of course it's really really important to know what has been certified as organic. But if you're a conventional grower and you're looking at biopesticides and conventional synthetics, uh, then you don't necessarily care what what's certified or not is, is what are the performance attributes? What is it bringing to the table that, that brings value to you as, as a producer? So. Thank you, John. I, 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 I could not agree with you more. Um, interesting conversation. So um, Brian, I, I, I don't know that, that you were supposed to be, um, I believe you were supposed to be covering this next section. I don't know if, if you're, uh, microphone is actually up for that or not? Oh, well, you, you tell me. If, if it's really bad, you can take over. How's that? So we're going to describe what, what uh, our, our bioinsecticides are. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about Venerate. 
Um, venerate is, uh, uh, we start with bacteria, Burkholderia, and it is, um, it's the fermentation, and inside the fermentation, there are organic compounds that are insecticidal. So um, we typically will get a, a very quick cessation of feeding, um, it's very good on soft-bodied insects, uh, even uh, quite effective on mice. Uh, more or less like an IGR mode of action where it uh, disrupts uh, the, the exoskeleton and interferes with molting and gut disruption. Um, let's see, adjuvants, not really. Um, I like to, as far as adjuvants recommendations, um, we do like something that's going to stick and spread. So the pinene product, uh, uh, we often will use, say, uh, uh, new film P, just simply because it has an organic label as well. Um, and then we do have all the options there. We, we have foliar intimidation uh, and then small use. So what are we doing? Uh, exoskeleton degradation and both on adults and on uh, immatures. Go ahead. Uh, molding interference. Uh, so both on, on the adults or on the immatures particularly. And then there's ingestion. Let's, and this is a good picture to show how uh, sometimes the slow, the, the kill is a little bit slow, but um, you will see after time uh, a cessation of movement and then also discoloration uh, and as, as the product begins to uh, have its effect. Now, Grandivo, uh, we're using a different bacteria. We've got Chromobacterium. Again, it's a fermentation process, uh, very similar to what we do with uh, venerate. Uh, both these products, I should say this, are low risk to beneficials, also low risk, risk to pollinators. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that on venerate, uh, the label says do not spray 4GB, but we know that it has very little activity on adult bees and also we fed it to the brood, very little activity there as well. But just keep in mind, if you're staying on label, uh, you do not spray 4GB. Uh, we're Grand Evil, again, no activity on bees and, and very, very low activity on beneficial. Uh, a little quicker activity, uh, typically we see cessation of feeding within seconds. And um, again, uh, these products can be used um, in, in quite a few different uh, settings along with the conventional chemistries and other microbial. There we go. So um, we do see a repellency effect, particularly aphids, gut disruption. Um, we also see a great reduction in fecundity or ability of those eggs to hatch. And as I mentioned before, uh, it does stop uh, uh, feeding very, very, very quickly. So we've had uh, quite a few different biological uh, studies of other uh, beneficial insects uh, listed there for you. Uh, activity very, very minor on, on all of them, uh, even at uh, two and three uh, 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 field usually. Okay, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the data that, we, that we've generated uh, over the years. And this one in particular was on rosy apple aphids. Again, uh, I believe uh, as far as the recommendation, timing is critical. We're looking at venerate um, use rate at one quart, two quarts. Uh, that's a common use rate. We can go up to four quarts. Um, looking at rosy apple aphid colonies, uh, comparing ourselves to a couple of uh, 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 conventional standards. And uh, performance is, is very good with uh, venerate on rosy apple aphid. Timing, however, I believe is critical. We do want to see uh, the application going in um, roughly at tank, so early. Next, uh, woolly apple aphid, same type of approach. Uh, again, looking at the one quart rate, uh, this, was, this was applied in late June. So you do have uh, a good opportunity to uh, pick up other pests um, and that timing. You're also going to be uh, getting some whack on your uh, apple maggots. You will also have an effect on first generation codling moth. Um, John's comment about uh, second generation codling moth is absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, generally speaking, uh, eggs from a codling moth are laid uh, on uh, cluster leaves. And so you typically, will, they've, got to, they've got to move across it. They've got to get a dose of it. They also need some time to die. Um, 
yeah, first generation seems to work okay. Uh, I would not at all recommend it for second generation for uh, FR cotton moss. Um, this was uh, one of the data points. Uh, again, I think John uh, shared uh, an earlier version of Paracilla. Um, we have the azaractin product uh, next to the untreated control uh, venerate. Uh, this was at a three quart rate, so a little tougher test to uh, get a handle on uh, compared to two other conventional products. Um, did a nice job. Uh, this was two foliar sprays, May 30th and July 17th and then the counts that uh, went along with the number of paracilla. Um, John, in this trial, you actually did trunk injection with venerate as well. Uh, performance was very good. So um, if someone's interested in looking at that, we can uh, dig that up and uh, make sure- yep, Brian, Brian, the only reason I didn't include the data is, was not a, a la labeled use. So I felt like that it was yeah. best not to present it unless they want you folks want to have a discussion. Yes, and that's just simply a, a, it's been looked at um, and uh, we would, as you said, would need to uh, include it in our next label submission. Uh, and looking at early, early, early season apple maggot control, again, preference being, I believe, to venerate, uh, comparing ourselves to Grand Evo and then also Imidan. Uh, the spray timing, as you can see uh, at the upper uh, right-hand side, uh, third cover and uh, fourth cover. Of Imidan plus Cycle. So it performed very well in, in early season apple maggot. Also, late season apple maggot, fourth, fifth, sixth cover sprays. And comparing ourselves to Imidan uh, uh, earlier, uh, that would be fourth cover, fifth and sixth cover were delegate, final cover was Imidan. And uh, so it compares very favorably to um, conventional programs. Now, this is something that we had a discussion with Peter Gents. I know you're on, if you're, uh, you care to weigh in on what we're good with that uh, uh, from Cornell University. We want to look at um, a couple of things. If you could take yourself all the way to the right hand column uh, that says percent survival, and then follow across to the untreated check and venerate, you'll see that survival was equivalent. The interesting thing was the column next to it and percent clean fruit. And in the untreated check, we are looking at 50% clean fruit, uh, venerate 100% clean fruit. We feel like this is um, uh, something to explore uh, further. This is a four quart rate of venerate, um, a see a need for something like this uh, in the uh, end of the season, the week before harvest, where we really have nothing else that the conventional program uh, can be using. And uh, venerate does a nice job. Of, of repelling pests. Doesn't kill them, it repels. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the, the point in the uh, uh, discussion that I drop out and let Lori take over. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us. I know we're over time, but we didn't want to shut down the Q&A. And so we'll finish up here um, quickly. Uh, Angela, you want to go ahead and advance the slide, please? Um, I just want to introduce uh, the team that you can contact if you have questions about any of the information that you have uh, been listening to today. Uh, we have a sales team over the, across the whole United States. We also, it doesn't show it here, but we have a brand new uh, territory manager just starting today up on the Eastern Cascades of the Pacific Northwest. And um, so we will have a, uh, um, somebody to support you there. In the meantime, um, you can always get a hold of me and then I can refer you if you are specifically in the apple um, and palm fruit growing region of uh, the Eastern Cascades. And then next slide, please. I want to introduce um, one more member. Well, we actually have two more members that you haven't, three more members that you haven't talked to today of our uh, technical support team. And I want uh, to make sure that you get a chance to um, know who some of them are. Morena Serdani is our Pacific Northwest technical support manager. She, um, we are very lucky to have her because she comes from 16 years experience as a diagnostician at the Oregon, um, uh, Oregon Science University's uh, Plant Pathology Lab. 
just an excellent resource for us. And so um, that's one of the things that we offer for all of our customers is um, the expertise of our PD team. And we also have Dr. Melissa O'Neill down in the California and Southwest region, um, who's a great asset to our team also with lots of experience with those crops. And then um, overseeing that whole team is Dr. Tim Johnson. And I believe he's on this call um, listening in and he um, is an expert in um, pretty much every crop we deal with and so much experience and so he's a great uh, leader for this team so we have all that experience to support uh, any questions that you have. Um, just want to uh, mention again for those of you who might have missed it at the very beginning if you need credits for this particular session we have them for uh, California DPR Oregon Department of Agriculture and um, Washington Department of Agriculture, as well as certified crop advisors. Certified crop advisors are the only ones who use the, um, the um, link at the left, but for the rest of you, you need to answer, you need to actually respond to the quiz that is going to be emailed to you and answer those questions. And please be sure and list the state as well as your your license number because some of you have multiple licenses and we need to know which state you're applying for and um and it really makes our lives easier because we're doing this manually as far as um um submitting all your license information and then don't hesitate to email us if you have any questions about that so um is are there any questions on our question and answer or chat session that uh, we still need to have answered i know we're running very late um i think there was one here i was seeing about crop safety and marking fruit with venerate and grandivo are there any tank mixes we should avoid avoid um would one of steve or would you or brian please or any of the um the panelist experts please answer that I'll, this is Brian Miller. Um, I'll go ahead and, and mention that I have not uh, seen any issues with uh, tank mix compatibility or um, uh, phytotoxicity using Grand Evil or Venom. And I, I have to concur with Brian. I've, I've not seen any, any challenges with those two materials. And Lois, while I've got it real quick, there was a question on about injecting, um, and I know that John cut John Wise covered some of the injected stuff. Um, Surgeon Asimovich from the uh, uh, Cornell re the Cornell Hudson Valley Research Station um, did some injecting of regalia for fire blight control. It was an interesting study. It was a small study on pears, but um, regalia injected did a remarkable job of managing fire blight. Okay. Thank you. Um, just I want to mention really quickly from my background, which is um, 15 years experience growing camise pears. If you are growing camise or one of the very, very sensitive varieties, please check with your uh, territory manager or product development person um, about uh, compatibility because some of those very sensitive varieties, um, we don't want to use generalized statements and I um, and so we can help you with that if you have specific questions about that. And um, so I think that is just about it. The other thing too, is if you have questions that we missed, please don't hesitate to respond back to the emails you're getting and it will get forwarded to the uh, appropriate person in your territory. And we will make sure we get everybody's questions answered. So don't feel like you got ignored if uh, we somehow overlooked it. There's been a lot of uh, discussion going on and it's easy to overlook a question. So I think, um, I think that is it. Angela, do you have anything more to add or anybody else on the panel? I do not. There are a lot of questions still in the Q&A that are open, but I'm going to trust that my colleagues, we've either answered them or um, I know that some of you are still typing answers in. So with that, I'll just remind everyone, uh, one, thank you for joining our webinar and um, make sure that if you are trying to receive credits, you will receive an email either later today or tomorrow with a copy of this presentation, as well as a, a copy of the recording of the webinar, and then a link to the quiz. I'll give you a due date on when you need to make sure to finish the quiz 
for those of you with California, California DPR um, licenses, you have to pass at a 70% pass rate. For the rest of you, you don't have a pass rate requirement, but we just need you to do the quiz and fill in your license numbers, as Lois said, to ensure that we've captured everyone. I know how frustrating it can be if you attended and then for some reason your license number was never captured and we can't give you credit. Um, with that, I will go ahead and thank my speakers. Uh, Dr. Wise, Dr. Cox, especially, thank you so much for the time that you've taken to share your expertise. Um, and then, of course, my colleagues at Marone Bio, this is definitely a joint effort, and I appreciate all of your help and uh, insight. With that, thank you so much again for attending, and I hope you all have a great day, and we see you soon on a future webinar. Bye-bye.